Welcome to Equipping the Corps. Marine Recon Units are the commander's eyes and ears on the battlefield. From clandestine missions to intelligence gathering, they're the silent force ensuring military readiness. Joining me today, Lieutenant Colonel Jason Hibbler, the Concept Development Team One Lead with the Experiment Division at Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, or as we call it, McQuill. Welcome to the show. Morgan, thanks for having me. I'm excited. We haven't had anyone on yet to talk recon. Well, I'm excited to talk yeah. about it. Anytime I get an opportunity to talk about the community and what, what, those, uh, what those guys are doing, it's always a good time. So uh, let's start with recon and then we'll get into McQuill. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, recon Marines are a special AUK field within infantry Marines? Yeah, so on the enlisted side? Yes. Uh, they will... Let's do both. Do both. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll start. So on the enlisted side, it'll be an 0321. Okay. Uh, is the designated for them. And then on the officer side, they'll get the B billet of 0307. And also just to add, uh, if, if it's the same on the officer side, they need to at least be an infantry officer. Well, I say at least be, but they need to either be an infantry officer or a ground intel officer. So what were you? I started you... as an infantry officer. Okay. Yeah. Back in, let's see. 2000, 2008. Not too long So ago. that's actually another important part, I think, when it comes to going over to the recon side. So on the enlisted side, we do have contracts for Marines to come in, like directly out of civilian life, directly into BRC in the program. If, they're, if the enlisted Marines are already in, I believe it's sergeant is when you can make the move over, over to the community. And then, you know, you'll put your package in to go to BRC. But on the officer side, you'll have to do at least like your first three to four years in the fleet, and then you'll have an opportunity to to come over. Okay. Um, so it does take a little bit of time, but it, it gives really a little bit more of that maturity uh, into the community. So it's not, you know, a lieutenant who's coming in on day one going into um, going over to the recon side. Would you say that it's more often the civilian side going into recon or Marines that are already in then making the... You know, I don't jump? have the numbers, but if I'm just thinking back in my time, I, somebody out there is probably thinking, oh yeah, it's definitely this or that. But I, I would think it was more that we're moving over from whatever their original MOS was yeah. over to the community versus, you know, guys that are coming uh, from the civilian life. But in reality, it may be a 50-50 split. I'm not really sure. Though. It's okay. Um, <laughs> you mentioned MRC. Uh, BRC, yeah, BRC, Basic what? Reconnaissance Course. Okay. And that's in uh, Camp Pendleton. So what's the training process in becoming a recon Marine? Yeah, so the first thing they're going to go through is BRC, or Basic Reconnaissance Course, that's out in uh, Camp Pendleton, California. So before that, I would say a couple things. If anyone's interested in going, I, I think the first stop would be to a recon battalion and find a, an actual recon Marine or just do some research to see if it's something you know, you'd want to do the job you'd want to do. The second thing in prep for BRC, I, again, would start with a recon battalion okay. or a McQuist or somebody who is a collegiate swimmer. Uh, the reason I say that is because the first month of BRC is nothing but, it's not nothing but, but it's mainly in the pool. Lots of swimming. Lot, tons of swimming. And, um, you know, I, I think in the past, you know, we, we'll have individuals that'll come through that have got a high PFT. They've got, you know, a perfect CFT. They're CrossFitters. You know, you've got all these, you know, you're physically fit. Yeah. Um, but as anybody who's a swimmer will know, you know, like the game changes uh, if you're not in that kind of shape. So I would talk to people that have been through it so they can give you a specific way to train. I'm not sure. There, there was a, uh, a program called MART. It was the a Marines... Marines awaiting reconnaissance training. Okay. Yeah, and a lot of the junior enlisted Marines would would go to that course. And I'll tell you, that course, th they were good. They were real good. Because this was months of nothing but just preparing for BRC. And by the time we got to the by the time we got to BRC, like by the time I got there, I mean these these dudes are swimming circles around us. Okay. Yeah, they were really good. So yeah, you'll go through BRC, it's it's three months. Um, at least what I went through, it was a month in Pendleton at the pool. Then you did a month in Coronado, uh, for your really open water phase. And then, and then we went back to Pendleton for patrol phase. Okay. But all in all three months. And another change, uh, I believe has been implemented is a bit of a pipeline. So 
again, I'll just refer it back to the way I went through. So I finished BRC and then I went to the battalion. And from the battalion is where you would get like your special insert and extract um, or variety of other schools. Okay. So like your dive, you know, your jump or your free fall. But now I think they've got it set up where once you're done with BRC, they'll send you to, you know, they'll send you to dive school, jump. You know, you'll essentially get schooled out before you get to the battalion. Okay. So, you so you're get, trained before you get there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know if that's in every case, uh, but I believe that's where they're at now. What were you trained in? So I went, yeah, so I finished BRC, went to the force company, to MEF, and then from there is when I went to dive school, uh, which is in Panama City. And then a few months later, I went to free fall. Yeah, th- those were the two schools, insert extract that I got up front. Okay. And then as I was uh, working up for the MU, we went through, you know, the EOTG package, uh, which is going to be VBSS or visit board search and seizure. And then uh, CQB or some additional, uh, you know, some additional training you'll get. But the bread and butter for all reconnaissance Marines is ground and amphibious reconnaissance and surveillance. And that's what they'll get at BRC. And then once okay. you get to the unit, once you get to the battalion, that's when they'll they'll expand on on that. You kind of specialize, or would you say that most recon marines get the dive, the free fall? It was more about what your specific mission was going to be. Okay. If you were going to be on a dive team, then obviously they would prioritize that school for you. If you were going to be on a on a jump team, then then um, free fall uh, would be it. I think now there's a better spread of those schools across across the community um, where, you know, most of the Marines will, will have both. Did you know you wanted to become a recon Marine when you joined the Marine Corps or did you decide that as you were in a little while? No, I didn't know that up front, but I do remember being a kid and watching movies and, you know, you would see some movies would have some force recon Marines, other movies would have seals, you know, any, anything in that world. Um, but after I did my first four years um, with really, it was Victor 324. It was a reserve battalion out of the Midwest. I deployed with like right as a second lieutenant. And then I came off that and I went to uh, Afghanistan with 39. Once I got done with that and it was about time for me to rotate out, that's when I started looking at the options. And yeah, recon at that point was, was on my mind. Uh, talk to the monitor. Like I said before, talk to the, went down to the recon battalion to see if this is what I was looking for and it ended up being. You're yeah. like, this is exactly what I'm looking yeah, for. This is, where, this is the route we need to go. So I didn't know that up front, but okay. um, yeah, once I spent a little time in the Marine Corps, got to know people and understand what the mission set was. Was there a reason you chose Marine Recon versus MARSOC? I think at the time it was I had had more contact with recon Marines than I had with MARSOC. And at okay. that time, this, I mean, we're talking, well, we're talking 2000, maybe 11, 12. You know, at that time, MARSOC was still a bit new. I mean, they were, you know, pretty grounded at that point. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, I think I just had more exposure to the recon Marines. And that was the route I, I wanted to go. I was going to ask, what is the difference between MARSOC yeah, and so recon? I, I would say if I could summarize it, it's really... Two things. So if, if you're a recon Marine, you're working for the Marine Corps. Like okay. You're working for Marine Corps general officers. And then if you are a MARSOC Marine, you're working for SOCOM. So that's the first one is the COMREL. And then the second one are the authorities. It, just inherently, we there's just two separate authorities between what the special operations community is doing and what, you know, the recon Marines are doing. Um, but, yeah, we have special operations forces like mission sets. Um, but yeah, ultimately two, two different things. Do you ever work together? Yeah, there, we, we have a lot of uh, like skill sets, especially when it comes to the insert extract yes, methods yeah. um, and then some of the, the actual mission sets. So just the reconnaissance and surveillance. So there is a lot of bleed over or the direct action side of things. So yeah, we cross train a lot. And it, you know, it doesn't need to just be MARSOC. You know, we've done work with the SEALs, with the Rangers. Yeah, so um, there's as much cross-training as we can get with, with the whole community. What would you say is your favorite 
part about being in Oricon. Yeah, hundred percent. It's it's the Marines. I mean, you're, you're walking into a community where I think you've got you know you've got just a group of individuals who all want to be there. You know that they've all been. We've all been through the same school, which is BRC. And one of the nice things about BRC is you know they don't separate it between enlisted and officer. You've got oh, you everybody do it together. is doing it together. And I think that is one of the most important aspects of BRC because it doesn't matter if you're a captain or you just came into the Marine Corps like, you know, a couple of months ago. Everybody is suffering in the same way. Yeah. And it's just a great opportunity for everyone to learn from, you know, from everyone that's there. And like I said, when I went to BRC, I mean, all those junior Marines who had been to Mart, I mean, they were legitimately swimming circles around us. I mean, they were good. Yeah. So when I got there, you know, we would have long conversations about different techniques they're using, how they're regulating their breathing, that kind of thing. And then, you know, when we get to patrol phase, that's something I felt really comfortable with, just being a, an infantry officer. You've done it. Right. And during patrol phase, you know, you'll get into planning, uh, which is something that I'm not sure a lot of them had. So that's like, I think, where we could step in and, and help out, help, you know, help everybody out. But ultimately, everybody is suffering the same way. Since this podcast does have gear in its name, um, let's slightly talk about gear. How do you think technology in recon has evolved since you joined the Oc field? There are two things that come to mind. One is communication. Like, how are we? How are we talking out there? And I, you know, I always say this. But other than the Marines themselves, the next most important thing to me is my ability to talk to my guys forward. I'm not saying commun- uh, continuous communication because uh, that's, you know, that's just bad practice. But if they're out there putting their life at risk, trying to collect the information, we, we got to get it somehow. And so an ability to, not want, number one, like know where they're at. So if there is an issue, you know, we can pull in, you know, either an extract method for them or close air support, whatever they need if something, you know, doesn't, doesn't go as planned. But number two... Yeah, they're going to spend all that time to get to the objective and start, you know, taking pictures and videos uh, and their reporting. Uh, You know, we've got to have a way to get that back. So communication, I know that we're always working on to make that more efficient. And then the second thing is really just making things smaller and lighter, you know, because, you know, there are several ways for, uh, you know, for a mission to go down. Sometimes you'll have a ULTV or, you know, I'll think back, you know, if anybody's seen Generation Kill. You know, they were in vehicles for a lot of the Iraq stuff. Um, But I think starting with just the basics where you're probably going to be on foot for a lot of the mission. Okay. uh, Yeah. Having things that are smaller and lighter, I think, are are, I know it's something that we're always we're always looking at. Um, That's a big push here at Syscom. Yeah. To make everything lighter. Yeah. Because and then it makes them faster. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Faster. And um, yeah, the other thing is, you know, most. Pretty much everything out there has got to be battery powered. So what kind of batteries are we using so it can be more efficient uh, so the gear can last longer, uh, which means ultimately they hopefully have to carry less batteries, which is reducing weight. And then if they can be rechargeable, I know that's a topic. Yeah, it is. (laughs) Yep. And, um, you know, I think we got some good companies out there looking at stuff like that. I'll I'll go back to, you know, like, I don't know. We need to tap into Tesla and see what they're doing. Yeah. (laughs) with their batteries that would be that would be nice yeah anytime you know if i get a chance to talk to my man elon yeah uh, that would be good elon if you're listening (laughs) come on over recon marines are equipped as all individual marines but is there anything you kind of touched on it but is there anything that you think is just essential for the recon community to have yeah i think in this case i just need to go back to the communications piece yeah yeah, for them to to reach out. And it's not communication over one, you know, waveform. I think, you know, having just a good pace plan, so your primary alternate contingency in an emergency, okay. um, I think is, the my opinion, the most important thing. Uh, do you have a favorite piece of gear or equipment? Loving on comms. I love comms. But one piece of gear we had that I thought was, it was just cool to have, is we used the M4A1s. And so these were... M4 weapons that you could put on full auto. So most okay. of the M16s or M4s that are issued to the Marine Corps writ large, um, you know, you can put it on three round burst is usually where it stops. 
Um, but for the ones that we had, you could you could go full auto on it. That is pretty. That's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was well, and it's it's helpful. It is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we didn't need to use it. You know, that often it really it would be in training just so you knew how how it was going to feel. Uh, you know, shooting standing with an M4 in full auto, um, but still just knowing that that capability is there. Yeah, made you that's a good pick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> comms is cool, but. <laughs> Yeah, being M4, able to a little cooler. Lay down a good base of yeah. fire. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to say about recon before we jump to McWill? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, it, it has been an, a blast in that community. I mean, it has just been uh, just a set of just some of the most motivated and like smart individuals I've ever met. I learned a, I learned a ton in that community. And again, it's so small and close knit that I still stay in contact with with a ton of people. Um, so yeah, if anybody's thinking about doing it, I would just do it, you know, just do it. Just do it. Um, but yeah, make sure, make sure you can swim. Uh, okay. So let's dive into McWill. Uh, okay. tell us a bit about your role and responsibilities. Yeah. So I work in experiment division. Okay. Um, well, when we talk about McWill as a whole, really we've, we've got wargaming division, science and technology, and then experiment division. So I am in the experiment division portion of that. So really what we're doing is we're taking technology that S&T, let's say, has been working on for a while. They've gotten it to a certain TRL level, um, or that's a technical readiness level. So essentially what that means is the thing is probably going to do, it pretty much does what we think it's going to do. Okay. Then it would come to us and we would inject it into live force experimentation. Uh, and that's where we can now take whatever that prototype is, inject it into a scenario with Marines operating the thing, and we can collect data. And for me, the most important part of what we're doing uh, from my seat now is the data collection. Um, it, really setting up an experiment such that we can collect good data. Because what that's going to do is allow me to go back write our reports and then ultimately inform the service on whether or not this thing is operating the way it should be and, and is it good for you know long-term implementation and you know eventually maybe get sent over to syscom uh to be to be fielded. to create requirements yeah it, well it's cdd and then, well yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. For, for you guys to actually um uh what am i looking at? procure sure. yeah <laughs> acquire acquire yeah <laughs> But yeah, so experimenting is is what I do, um, and yeah, the data collection part I think is the most in, the most important part of that. So you're a data guy. Do you love the data? I you, yes. Okay. I do love the data because I feel like in a lot of ways the data. Okay, how do I put this? Data can be very subjective, but I prefer numbers over, you know, just one's feeling on a certain thing. You know, if I can. If qualitative I can quantify yeah as much as i can um I, I just you know ultimately feel better about that when having to make a decision no no you need the you need the data to back up the decision because if not it's just yep. well this is going to work we like it so let's go with that yeah we, yeah. Yeah, we hope this is going to work yeah. but if after the you know the course of a few exercises or experiments right the data is still showing that it's not really operating the way we need it to uh you know i think that that gives us a, a place to go from versus the hope uh, of it could one day yeah. work the way that we want it to. Yeah. And I think we can always get there too. You know, the hope that it'll work. Perfect. Uh, we just need the, I think the data to know exactly where we're at and what needs to change um, or what new experiments we need to set up so that in the future it, it does work the way we want it to. Do we have a set amount of experiments it has to go through? before we determine if it's a viable solution or not? I don't or think so, no. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, no, I, I don't think there's, well, I've never seen anything that says there's a set amount of experiments it needs to go through. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that, that's about all I got for you on that one. I don't think there that's is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're the team one lead. What Correct. exactly does that mean? Are there other, I'm assuming there's other teams? Yeah, yes. so I am CDT1, so that's Concept Development Team 1. Now, the way that we have been organized is T1 
team one was working primarily with one meth, team two with two meth, and then team three with three meth. Oh, okay. Yep. But I think as we move forward, uh, it's going to be less of those teams being dedicated to a specific meth. And it'll, it'll really be a matter of, as we look at the team, as we look at all the experiments we want to get after throughout the year, it's just setting up a schedule where, you know, I can go out and do an experiment because the experiment's really just the first part of that. Well, I'll back up. First, we have all the planning up to the experiment. Then Very we have important. The ex- it is, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it, you know, it can take months, yes. you know, to, to get this ready to go. But then we have the experiment itself where we're collecting all the data. But again, the most important part of what we do is on the back end where we're writing the reports and we need to analyze that data so that we can make sense of it. Um, but that, that in itself could take months. So what I'm getting at is I, the way we're going to set up the teams now is we want to make sure that we're giving them enough time to do all the planning for the experiment, gather the data, analyze the data, write the reports okay. before really they're getting thrown into another experiment. Some of these things are just inherently going to overlap, but we're trying to do a better job of making sure that things are, um, you know, spaced out. So what that's going to result in, I think, is not being tied to a specific, none of the teams being tied to the specific MEFs. Because certain I mean, MEFs do more experimentation than, or I don't want to say experimentation, exercises, would you say? So yeah. I know all the MEFs are heavily involved all year round. Um, but for the things, I can really only speak on one map. On your, yes. But I know, yeah, one map is getting after it. And they, you know, they were going from one thing to another. Um, it was becoming difficult for us to just stay up with how fast they were moving. Because, um, yeah, we, we just, we were in a position where it's like, all right, we got a ton of analyzing we got to do. But and, no time to analyze. Because yeah. if you're going out again, it makes it difficult. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, the, like the analyze analytical part of it's going to get done um but it's again we look at manning just bandwidth for everybody uh the amount of gel events they have and when i say gel it's the joint event life cycle so your ipc your mpc all the planning conferences that come along with that um obviously we we want to have people there so that we're fully integrated into into the plan yeah um, the war fighting lab is unique, and you mentioned this, is it uses operating forces for its experimentation. Yep. Why is this so important? The gear comes to us after, you know, s and had it. What we're really trying to get a sense of is how does this gear operate? So when, when s and has it, I look at that as more of like in the lab, more of a controlled environment. They're, they'll do LTAs or limited technical assessments. But when it comes to us, we're trying to get it in live force experimentation such that no kidding Marines are out there using it in their COC or wherever they're at in the field. And I think it just gives us a, it's like the next stepping stone on getting a, a better look on how well this gear is going to gonna operate, you know, under realistic conditions. And how are Marines handling it? Exactly. In that yeah. Like, it, you know, these things, you know, I don't know, these things breaking all the time, you know? Um, what, what's heat doing to it, you know, out in the field, you got dust and you got rain and mud and all the other things that come with like an operational environment. So that, that's why it's important for us to get it in the hands of the Marines. Plus, you know, it's always good for the Marines to just understand, Hey, here's maybe what's coming. Cause if, if I have given them something we're going to experiment with that thing at that time might be one of one, right? Yeah. So if nothing more, it's kind of just getting them a little more educated on here. Here's what may be in the future. You know, you guys are one of the first units to get it. Just give us your like unfiltered feedback on what you think of this thing. And that is some of the, the best data I can get, although not a numbers situation, but just taking a Marine's word for, Hey, tell me how this thing worked for you. And, and they're going to be honest. And that's Marines what I need. Are, yeah, they're I honest. need people just to be honest because if it's not, or they're having issues, that's exactly what I need to know. And the other thing I need to remind myself, too, when I first got to uh, McWill, well, I need to remind myself that I am at McWill. And what I mean by that is that the gear we're using isn't fully fleshed out yet. Yeah. There is a lot of work that still needs to be done on these things. Um, so I think making sure that the, the Marines know that. 
Yes. Like this new thing isn't just like a magic box, you know, that's going to solve, yeah. you know, all, all the issues. We're still um, experimenting. We're experimenting mm-hmm. with it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so kind of setting that expectation up front, I've noticed has been very important. Uh, it, it, was, <laughs> it was important for me to understand that. And uh, yeah, I think it's now important for the Marines yeah. to know that. It helps to manage your expectations as you're working with it. Like, yeah. Why isn't it doing exactly what I want it to, right. you know? It's, it's like, this is, this is an experiment. <laughs> Yeah. It's not the final product yet. Right. Yeah. Right. So you were recently in California supporting uh, PC4 or Project Convergence Capstone 4. Um, that's how we connected. Yep. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the work you all were doing out there? Yeah. So PC4 is an Army-led exercise. Um, and really what it is is, I call it an exercise, but really what it is is one big experiment. And it's joint and combined. And for all the years I've been in the middle, well, okay, I say all the years. It's been like 16 and a half. I know that, you know, to some people that's not that long. Oh, it's kind of long. But this was maybe one of the first exercise slash experiments I had been part of that I really think was as joint as you could get. I mean, we had all the services there, Marines, Navy, Air Force, Army. Um, But then we add in our coalition partners. I, I don't remember how many... Uh, partners we had there was probably seven, eight, maybe. It was, it was a good bit. It was a lot, uh, yeah. yeah. And when we look at the future fight and we look at CJAD, C2, so the combined joint, all domain, uh, command and control, uh, this was a really good look to, to see whether or not we can all communicate, um, you know, c- communicate in that digital yes. world. And I think largely it was a success. And I, I know the ones and zeros, you know, were moving the way that they should have been. Um, and now I think it's as we move on, it's it's really about latency. Well, how long did the one and zero take to get to wherever it needed to be? Um, so, yeah, uh, Capstone 4 was was great to see. It was a massive, 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 massive exercise. Well, massive experiment. Um, but yeah, we were out there with some McWill and Marine Corps and Navy specific objectives that, you know, were nested really under the, the experiment as a whole. But yeah, overall, it, it was a great time. I thought it was a success. Yeah. I, it was really neat to see all the services come together yeah. when I was out there. Um, so you also were supporting Still Night yes. prior to Capstone 4. Correct. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so Steel Knight is a 1st Marine Division exercise, and really the, the point of the MRX uh, portion of Steel Knight uh, is to certify 1st or 5th Marines as MRFD. What's um, MRFD? MRFD is uh, Marine Rotational Force Darwin. Okay. So the, the Marines that will go down to Australia. Sure. I believe that's the acronym. We can uh, confirm. But, yeah, so... So it was a larger first Marine division led exercise, okay. but yeah, really the, the, the event there is certifying, uh, at least when I, when I was participating, which was steel Knight 23 tac two, it was to certify fifth Marines as, as Murph D. Um, but we brought some experiments to the table, uh, during that. And really those included, those included, I'm um, thinking back, we've got a forging experiment. Um, so forging really being, which I, which I think is important because for the, for the time that I've been in the military, you know, I, I grew up in the CENTCOM Middle East fight and, you know, if, if we, I never felt like I was out of supplies, right? If I needed food, I got it. If I needed ammo, I got it, water, whatever. Um, but as we look out West and the contested, the potential contested environment we'll be in those resupplies may not be as readily available. Um, plus the, the distances we see just anywhere in the world, um, you know, it's, I think it'll be important for Marines to be able to sustain themselves. Yes. Or how are they going to do that? How are they going to sustain themselves potentially for weeks or, I don't know, months on end when you're not having your typical supply chain? It ties into the contested logistics conversation of exactly. how we're going to get gear all the way over there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, just other things that people may not think about, like where are your contracting officers positioned, right? Because if we got to feed a, if you've got an EAB out there and you got to feed them for 
let's just say a week or two weeks or whatever, you know, that's, that's going to be some money that you're going to need to live on the local economy for. And where's that money coming from? And, you know, sure, you could probably go forward with some, with some cash, but, you know, that's only going to last so long. So where, where are the positioning of the contracting officers so that you can, you know, continue to sustain the force? Um, and the big piece on that is whether or not we're in a contested communications environment. So I did, um, I was a SERP uh, Marine in CENTCOM. So SERP is the Commander's Emergency Response Program. Okay. So really I was doing projects when I was in Afghanistan with 3-9. And, you know, I worked with the contracting officer a lot to do different projects, whether that's like build a well or we're going to, we're going to, I don't know, clean out, a, you know, a canal, you know, so the water can flow easier or whatever. Um, but it was all dependent on my interaction with the contracting officer. And so I needed communication with them. In my case, I was right down the road, so to speak, you know, from the KO. So I could send them all my documents, all my requirements digitally, and it was no issue. And then when I needed to pick up the money, the actual cash, I would just, you know, take a drive up to where our battalion was, uh, you know, fill a bag of cash and then, you know, come down and pay out the contractors. All those things I'm talking about right now may not necessarily be the environment we're in in the future fight. You were also out at Still Night. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So we executed Steel Night at the end of November, early December of 2023. Yeah, 2023. Yeah, we're in 24 trying now. Trying to think back of what year we're in. Um, but yeah, that is a 1st Marine Division-led uh, exercise. And really the point there or for the MRX portion of it is to certify either 1st or 5th Marines as MRF D. And that's, um, if I'm remembering correctly, Marine Rotational Force Darwin. So the Marines that will go, uh, go down to Australia. Yeah, so that's really the focus of the exercise. Um, but we, we did have... Huge Navy uh, integration for this one. Um, and really, as McWill, we came out to do some experiments. And those included, um, so family of integrated targeting cells. We did foraging. That uh, was an experiment. Prolonged uh, in-route care. So really, I, you know, that, that one talking about, hey, you know, as we look at different areas of the world, um, I think a lot of us are, have, are used to the CENTCOM model where it's four hours from the time you have a casualty or a point of injury to, you know, the roll two or roll three. Um, but in this case, in different areas of the world, it may take much longer to get somewhere. Uh, so it was really us just taking a look at what, what, kind, of, what kind of stuff are we going to need to make that happen? Is there any new technology um, that can assist with that with that problem set okay. because we know we're not going to get more people right. We're not going to have more doctors, more corpsmen, you know. Uh, so so now it's it's a matter of seeing, uh, yeah. Do do we have technology out there that can help enable the people that are on the ground to keep keep casualties safe and sustain them for longer periods of time? And then what was let's see the last one? Oh, advanced manufacturing. So a lot of the three D printing stuff. Uh, was was all incorporated into uh, Steel Knight. But ultimately, large exercise. We had such, we had amazing support from 1st Marine Division. I can't thank them enough because, you know, we work by, with, and through the fleet. Because, uh, you know, McWill doesn't have a lot of, you know, uh, we don't have RSOs, OICs, we don't have vehicles, you know, everything else we needed for support. And so we came to the table asking for a lot, and First Marine Division just jumped all over it, and they they hooked us up with whatever we needed to uh, to support the experiment. So a huge huge thanks to them. Sounds like a great experiment. It was. It was yeah. good. Um, is there anything else you want to add about McWill, the work you've been doing? Yeah, I I think overall McWill is such an interesting place because you're getting a look behind the curtains on, you know, what's to come. I mean, we're really looking at all future Marine Corps stuff. And so, you know, it's just great to be, be a part of that um, and, and really understand what the future fight may entail. And, you know, as we look at McWill and our interaction with industry, yeah, it's, it's, it's trying to just solve complex problems. 
and we got just a, a great team of people that are, are working working their butts off trying to trying to do that. I don't think I've ever met anyone at McWill that I didn't like, so <laughs> y'all are in my top. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm glad I can I can I can be part of that yeah, part of yeah. that crew. Everyone's always been really nice and helpful. Now that we understand the role of recon and then we have an idea of what you're doing over at McWill, let's talk about you for a bit. Okay, let's go. Okay. Um, so you've been at McWell for a little over a year. Yeah, I got yeah. there in June. Okay. Uh, so a little oh, under so, a year. So not even a year. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I'm still new. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about your career up until this point? Yeah. So came in. You know, I went to TBS in 2008, IOC in 2009. Um, as I said earlier, you know, my initial battalion was uh, 324 Reserve Battalion out of the Midwest, and you know, we did a uh, deployment to Iraq. And believe it or not, during that same deployment, we went to Iraq and Afghanistan. So it was, I think I now know is, you know, not common. Moment, no. Um, then, yeah, I went to 3-9. I was a weapons platoon commander there. And then uh, once I got done with 3-9, this is when I started the kind of the, the recon pathway. Okay. So I went to school at MCCC. Uh, which is the Army's Maneuver Captain's Career course, um, and then went to BRC and then checked in the second recon. Did a deployment on the 24th Mew, got done with that, and then went out the third recon, uh, was the force company commander out there. And then, uh, then when I got done with that, that is now where I got some CISCOM blood in me, is I went to Orlando, Florida, Oh, and you know what? Honestly, traces. Yeah, PM Traces, okay. Program Manager Training Systems. And, you know, when I saw my orders, my, my first thing was, all right, I'm not sure what PM Traces is, right? I wasn't really familiar with, with uh, Syscom. Uh, but then I saw a location, Orlando. I'm like, oh, okay, we're good. We are <laughs> You're all like, good. it's Orlando. We're, we're going to figure this <laughs> out. Yeah, so I went down to Orlando uh, with Traces for a little bit. And then while I was there, um, or actually once I was done there, I went down to Fort Bragg and I was with uh, Joint Special Operations Command uh, for a few years, then to the 15th MU, and now I'm here. With You've been Blood. everywhere. Yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of moving around over the years, but it's been good to just get, just see as much as I, and be involved as, as much as I possibly can. Did you always know that you wanted to join the Marine Corps as a kid? I think, okay, so... Or I guess I Maybe. should say, why did you join the Marine Corps? I, I think, you know, so I was in high school when 9-11 happened, as I'm sure a lot of people were, you know, that, that remember that. So I was old enough to understand what was going on. You know, I didn't maybe at that time didn't understand all the details, uh, but I know what I saw. Right. And it's not good. So once that happened, that really changed my mindset to like, all right, let's finish high school. Let's go to the military. So then the next big question is, well, what branch of service do you go to? And so, you know, you hear all the things about Marines, like they're the toughest, they're in all the fighting, right? They're just the baddest. Um, but then I had some friends that graduated high school and went directly into the Marine Corps. Whereas, I, you know, I, I went to college. Yes. Um, so I had a little bit of lag time there, but I would get feedback from them. And, you know, we're talking about guys that were part of things like Fallujah, you know, battles like Fallujah. Anyway, the more I would talk to them, I'm like, all right, that's it. That's where I need to go. I need to be there. Um, so, yeah, once I graduated college, you know, commissioned, and then, uh, yeah, I went to TBS, and, and here we are today. Uh, where did you go to college? I went to Western Illinois University. It's out in uh, <laughs> the western portion of <laughs> Illinois. Um, but, yeah, it's in a place called Macomb. Okay. Um, and you're from a town that's around Chicago? Yeah, so uh, I usually just say Chicago, Chicago? Okay. but it, but people that are from Chicago, they're like, wait from... a second, but I'm really from Joliet, so Joliet. it's about 30 okay. minutes southwest of Chicago. Okay. Um, the Burbs. Yeah, the Burbs, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that was maybe three hours away from where college was. Okay. Is your family still out there? Still out there. Yep. Most of the family is still up in the Chicago area, and yeah, so I, I try to go back as much as possible and so I know you play guitar and you yes. sing in a band. Um, do you have any other hobbies? So 
Or do you want to talk so, so about your really music? So really, I do. I do play guitar and sing. Uh, I wouldn't call it a band though. It's okay. more uh, think 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 Ed Sheeran. Just not as good. But it's just me, a guitar, and a and a looper. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I play out when I when I get free time. Um, but other hobbies. So, you know who Bob Ross is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love Bob Ross. Um, so when I was a kid. You know, I would just see Bob Ross on like PBS or whatever. Uh, and I always remember enjoying watching him do his thing. Uh, you know, in 25 minutes, you'll start with a blank canvas and you'll have a masterpiece yeah. like 25 minutes later. It was always very interesting. But then as I got older and Internet's doing its thing and then YouTube comes out and I realized that we got tons of Bob Ross episodes on YouTube. So I started watching that a lot. It was like a little bit of an ASMR kind yeah. of thing. And then finally, one day, I was like, I'm just going to do it. So I went out, got all the Bob Ross paints, got a canvas, got some brushes. And yeah, I painted a little, little, a little, you know, I, yeah, I, I followed Bob Ross's instruction. And I'll tell you, he's right on. He's not, he's not messing around. But yeah, watching him paint like a happy little tree, I'm like, I can do that. I know I can do that. So yeah, painting is something I'll do every once in a while. Um, what else? Recently getting into golf, you know, oh. I grew up my life kind of dibble dabbling in, in golf, but recently uh, it's been more of an interest to me. But slow pace sport. Slow pace, but yeah, frustrating, you know, it needs that, you need that focus. Uh, no matter how much I try, I feel like, you know, the ball still doesn't go where I want it to. <laughs> We're going to get there though one day. But the other thing, one thing that takes up a lot of my time, maybe my free time, is anything having to do with space. Space in the cosmos and rockets. I just okay. love what we're doing over there. And so when we look at specifically for me, I've just been so impressed with SpaceX. And I know I brought up Elon earlier, but man, I just like what the guy's doing. X aside and whatever he's doing on X, that's a separate subject. I'm just talking about SpaceX. And I think there's a lot of parallels to what we do at McWill. To um, the experimentation. Yeah. yeah, the experimentation. I think the, the model that, you know, that company or he and that company have set up where it's rapid iteration on, on designs and prototypes. And, you know, we're going to, or it's like, hey, we have this idea for Starship, for example. If nobody knows what Starship is, go Google it. I'm telling you, it is the biggest and most powerful rocket that man has ever made. It's twice as powerful as a Saturn V. The Saturn V was the rocket that took us to the moon, you know, from 69 to I think 72 was the last mission. Anyway, that's that's saying a lot. But Elon, you're like an expert. Elon, well, yeah, you know, this is a very interesting thing to me. But Elon and his team are like, hey, we have this idea for a rocket. And, you know, obviously I'm not the guy sitting in there, you know, doing the math with them. But this is what I think it went like. But hey, we got this idea for a rocket. All right. We'll do a couple calculations. We think we can get it. But, you know, quickly you'll see them start putting things together, prototypes. And these prototypes aren't like, oh, let's make an 80% solution. It's like, we're going to make like a 32% solution and we'll just see what happens. But now this gets into what we do at McWill. It's the data collection side of things. They're just going to launch it. They know it's likely the thing's going to fail. And, um, but it's all about that data collection. But then they're going to quickly build another one and just launch it again and just see what it does, collecting more data. And I think that's why we've seen SpaceX move at the pace that they do. Where other companies, they may want to get as close to 100% as they can possibly be. Um, but that takes time. It takes a lot of time to, to get there. And you just need the testing to kind of validate, you know, what your, what your assumptions are. Let's just go ahead and jump into the lightning round. Okay. Questions. Let's go. Um, so these will just be first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. Just say the answer. Okay. Okay. Favorite TV show, book, movie, or podcast? The Office. Okay. Favorite ice cream fla flavor? Oh, chocolate. Really? I know, it's so plain. <laughs> but you know, it's tried and true. I love it. Uh, if you can have an unlimited supply of one thing, what would it be? Money? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> and what was your favorite duty station? Orlando, Florida. PM Traces, yep. Really? Yeah. Huh, okay. Well, I mean, it was it was the best I'm not, I'm in both not. worlds. I mean, I, I was learning stuff in acquisitions, which is, it is interesting at the end of the day. 
Um, it's not something I want to do for the rest of my life, but it was interesting to kind of learn a new skill set. Uh, but Orlando, Florida itself, the location is what made that great. Because, you know, at that time, however many years I had in the Marine Corps, it was just like, go, 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 go. And then finally you get to a place where things kind of just slow down a little bit. And then you got, you know, some rest and refit time. Plus you're in Orlando, the weather's solid. I'm not a big Disney or Universal guy, but those are there if you need them. We got beaches. Now here's the most important part about Orlando. There's two things actually. The first thing is I am like, an hour and five minutes away from Cape Canaveral, which is where, that's where we're launching, launching rockets. So that was good for me to reinvigorate this love of space. The second thing though, is when I play music, you know, Orlando is just built on entertainment. Yeah. So any night of the week, there's probably a thousand gigs that are out there. And so I was playing, man, when I was in Orlando, I was probably playing five, six, seven gigs a week. Like a week, yeah, it was awesome. I had a really set schedule at Traces, and I, I could just plan these this music around. So it was a it was a great time for me. Okay, yeah, I only made that face because most people would say like California or yeah, you know, no, no, I've never heard anyone say Orlando. Really, yeah. 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 I think when I retire one of these days, that's where I need to end up. Is back down in Florida. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. I learned a lot. But yeah, no, I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Equipping the Core. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcasting platform or on social media. We'd love to hear from you.